ready to start and we're going to have with us the uh, presentation that deals with assessment uh, titled the borough of Manhattan collaborative improvement model using collaboration visionary thinking and rigorous data to achieve our preferred future uh, this presentation will different from others there will be a lot of interaction, so that's why we're leaving the lights on, because uh, Dr. Delgado asked me uh, for that so she can see you and you'll be interacting with her. Uh, the presenter is Dr. Jane Delgado. She's the Dean for Institutional Effectiveness and Strategic Planning at Borough of Manhattan Community College uh, from CUNY. And she, as a footnote, received the highest score on the assessment track during the evaluation process. So without further ado, let's welcome Dr. Jane Delgado. That's noisy. Okay, the interaction is going to be partially with me, but it's going to be partially with each other. So those of you who are sitting alone in a row, may I ask you to go sit next to someone, please. Go sit next to someone, please. <clears throat> I spent a lot of time in teacher professional development K-12, and they were very clear with me that I'm not allowed to lecture. Okay, so, so you will take advantage of all those great skills I learned from them. So Borough of Manhattan Community College is a large community college in um, the Tribeca area of Manhattan. Please come and visit us whenever you're in the area. What I'm going to try to do today, and I promised interaction, I promised takeaways, um, I've combined a lot of information here and I've tried to make it um, something that you can take away. You may have to email me, so I've put my PowerPoint, um, I've put my email address at the end. You can wait until then or you can find me in the program and, and try to get a hold of me that way. But one way or the other, we will have this information for you in a way that you can use it. What I want to talk about first, <coughs> um, almost the first half, maybe not that long, is the BMCC Collaborative Improvement Model and what we've done in the last three years of working with the entire campus, four years of working with the cabinet. And so I'm telling you, it took a, a year of working with the senior leadership. They're all very, very high on this idea now. We've seen it, we've got lessons learned and we're doing well. And I'll talk a little bit about the human process of of strategic planning at our school and in general for higher ed. And then my favorite part is the data part, data, 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 data. I'm an organizational psychologist. I was a consultant in evaluation and assessment and worked in assessment organizations. So I have a love relationship with data. And so you're gonna have to see some of that too. And particularly the part where I get um, I become a missionary is the part about making causal inferences in evaluation. So I'm hoping that that, that works for you. Finally, just to, to, to end it, talking about what it means to be a learning, and learning organization, particularly in higher ed. I'm going to gather some data. Actually, this is virtual data. You're going to write down your own rating in response to the following question. So this is your pre-assessment, and at the end we'll have your post, all right? Okay, this is a question. You are to rate where you stand on this particular issue right now. This is a statement. Our college can change the world. What do you think? Strongly agree, agree, disagree, strongly disagree. Okay, then we'll just remember this for later. 
The BMCC Collaborative Improvement Model, I love this graphic. So we're going to go through it, but I'm going to actually spend more detailed time on the components of the model. The foundational piece of our collaborative improvement model is the planning and assessment team. And that functions in every non-instructional department as well as the instructional ones. We've had real good success with the non-instructional departments in getting them to think about assessment and think about planning. And so that's where we focused originally. They interact with their divisions. Overseeing the whole process is what's called the Collaborative Improvement Council. And then we have four strategic steering committees that are aligned to our strategic priorities. So we have supporting faculty success, we have supporting student success, institutional success, and global studies. Planning and assessment team, the director or the chair of the department identifies them, and then they come together for a workshop with our department. They're supposed to identify and document for the department their core strengths and values. So they are really working from a positive perspective. Every department is supposed to have a mission statement. You all have those at your school, too. They're defining objectives and goal outcomes, the means of assessment, and the criteria for success. They review the data and use the information to improve practice. We use the five-column model. We have that document for them. And we talk about closing the loop, which I understand is one of those things you're not so great, you're not so happy about hearing so much anymore, but you know what it is. They define a preferred future for their own team and come up with a set of vision statements, and then we hope they come up with strategic action projects. I'll show you how that mechanism works later on. The strategic steering committees are four think tanks, and they're responsible for action planning. For some reason, we are really good at setting goals and objectives. We spend a lot of time on that. We talk to each other about it. Getting to the place where you actually have a mechanism for achieving the goals and objectives or the mission is another step, and it's another set of skills. So that's what this process is trying to build campus-wide. We're building this capacity to get from what my goal and objective or mission statement says to what am I going to do about it? What are my strategic projects? What are my strategic initiatives? What are we actually going to be doing? We do these open calls every year now. We have a vision day where we spend a whole lot of time sharing data. And it's open to everyone. I mean everyone. Faculty, staff, students. Last time we got 40 students and it changed the discussion completely. Nobody gets paid. They get service credit. They can talk about how they're participating in this when it comes time to talk with their chair but no one gets paid or release time for this. They review the data. They brainstorm their future vision for the campus, the total campus. And then they work in the steering committees with senior administrators as their sponsors and advocates. So they have to convince those senior administrators first before it goes to the total campus deliberation. They form work teams right away. It's not enough to just brainstorm a wonderful idea. We have to get together in a team to make it happen, at least to propose how you would do it. That's the new part. They have an ongoing role. So they meet with their work teams every month. And I don't monitor that. The facilitators make that happen. And then bi-monthly, we have big meetings where we build capacity and share data and, and talk about how you make decisions as a group, those kinds of things. The key piece here is the Collaborative Improvement Council. And it's an unprecedented access group at this point. Everybody in the president's cabinet is, in, is on this council. And we've invited about the same size group from every division and every level. We let the chairs of the departments ask. In other words, we didn't go invite chairs and have them say no. We waited for a year. They, were got, they got curious about what this council was doing. And then they came to us and said, I want to participate. 
So it's really starting with those people who want to do this, and then the word spreads. They review all the data, everything that we get at the end of the year about how we're doing relative to our goals and objectives and our mission. <clears throat> and then they look at the strategic plan that we have and the initiatives and projects that we've put in the plan. It's an ongoing strategic plan now. We look at it every year. We have projects that we follow in terms of the data that are being collected, in terms of their effectiveness. They come in to the strategic plan, they may go out. They come in, they get done, they go out. So the, what we're doing now is an ongoing annual review of our strategic plan and the mission and goals. They look at the new ones that are coming in from the work teams and from the divisions. They're proposing that we do these things and allocate resources to these things and that Collaborative Improvement Council looks at those and reviews them in small groups in discussion. And then they suggest the resource allocation priorities to the president. Once it's in the plan, we believe that it has to be done. The, the campus is committed to doing it. They meet twice a year, once in the winter, which is going to happen in the next month, and at the annual strategic planning retreat in the summer, with which we try to make really fun. So strategic planning at BMCC. <clears throat> For me, strategic planning is a human process. And when you look at the history of strategic planning in the world, it's interesting, but the Society of College and University uh, presidents and, and others in higher ed have said, we can follow what business has shown us about how to do strategic planning, but it's got to look a little different for us. So when they looked at all the research on what people define as strategic planning, the consensus was there are certain things that are key. It's future-oriented, so it's not what we did. It's not what we're doing particularly right now. It's where we want to go. It should influence decision-making. In other words, we need to refer to it. We can't just leave it there, put out the nice brochure, put it up on the website, and then go away for five years or 10 whenever we have to look at it again. And it should identify the ways in which we will achieve the future. That's the hard part, not just what it is we want to be doing and how we want to do it. It's important that everybody knows those things, but we need to know how we're going to do it. What's the mechanism? What are the projects? What are the initiatives? In business, it's usually an executive responsibility. They might get some input, they'll let you know people come in and maybe talk to them about it, but then they're going to decide. In higher ed, and it's pretty top down. They're, they're going to decide for the whole organization. In higher ed, because of shared governance and because of our mission, because we're a nonprofit, it should be all levels of the organization who get to think about the future and think about how to make it better. So how do we do this at BMCC? We started with some good philosophical orientations. Um, this one I like particularly. It makes sense to me. Everything is designed in conversation. If you're trying to do something difficult and you're not sure what the answer is, you need a diverse group to come together and talk about it. And I mean diverse because experts are usually pretty narrow in their expertise. If you want really good solutions or really good ideas, you need to bring a lot of experts together from different environments, from different backgrounds then you get a really good solution. This I like, I keep it in, sometimes I take it out. This is Google and Siruwaki, who was the, the New York Times, or the New Yorker reporter who wrote The Wisdom of Crowds, I recommend. Carl Sandburg said it first in 1936. He said it slightly differently. He said, everybody is smarter than anybody, but I think Google switched it. What it means is that that diverse expert group is the best solution to a problem in complex kinds of environments. So here's your first interact. This is, again, interacting with yourself. 
you can talk to each other about this for just a second, but I know you've all been in these groups where you're trying to figure things out, maybe solve a problem, design a process, change a policy, and you pull everybody together, right? Everybody's done this? Okay, and you remember the solution that you guys came up with? Worked pretty well? What if you'd gone into a room and decided to fix it yourself? <laughs> Would not have happened. This is really good to know, you know, people who think, you know, they, they have the answers. Um, nobody's as smart as everybody. Okay, so our process has these steps. We look at our mission, we look at our goals and objectives, we had a strategic plan that had goals and objectives, but we didn't have any projects. We didn't have any initiatives. We weren't connecting anything on the campus to that plan. We needed to do that. We also need to acknowledge our, stake our stakeholders, look at our data, my favorite part, and identify our strengths. That's what we're about with the data. It's where we're really good and celebrating our successes. When you imagine a preferred future, that's when we get to the part where, what can we do better? And you'll see how that works in a minute. Then we have to do, how do I make it happen? What's my action plan? Then we have to make sure that it's something that everyone, particularly senior leadership, particularly the college president, thinks is a good idea. Because that's where the resource allocation decisions are made. We implement, we assess, we evaluate, and we renew annually. We may not have data for everything every year, but we have a lot of annual data, and I'll share that, how we do that. We're lucky, we're part of CUNY, so we are data rich. Here's what I was faced with when I got to BMCC. What do our stakeholders want? We have stakeholders. We have CUNY, we are a component of the CUNY University system. We have Middle States. Middle States has standards for accreditation. And we did a self-study where we told ourselves how many things we needed to change. And we got a report, so there, were, there was more of that. We at BMCC have a set of mission and goals, and we had a strategic plan with four strategic board and 30, okay. So this was my attempt to make sense of all of that. Nah, no, you don't have to read this. <clears throat> this is one of four logic models that attempts to connect all of those stakeholder needs, objectives, goals to our strategic plan. Okay, there's concrete stuff going on, but we need to make it manageable if we're gonna involve everyone. <sighs> okay, so we've been focusing on our four strategic priorities. Pretty much everyone now who's in a steering committee or a collaborative improvement council or been in the workshops that we do with the uh, planning teams, assessment and planning teams, has a handle on this. We have excellence in teaching, research, and learning, organizational effectiveness, student success and retention. Those are pretty manageable, not completely distinct. You'll see as people start to plan, hey, I can't do success and retention without excellence in teaching, research, and learning, and vice versa. But in general, I've got senior leadership lined up to advocate and sponsor in each of these areas. So it's pretty good. Okay, so how do we get from our priorities to action? Philosophical beginning points were appreciative inquiry and preferred futuring. I recommend them. Most of these consultants that you get in who are gonna come for a couple days and help you get strategic planning started, They'll get you to that place where you get to the goals and objectives, but then when you've got to do the long haul, when you've got to really make sure you've got plans, strategic initiatives, action, uh, something in place to make it happen, that's when you're going to be working, in, working on your own with your colleagues. This is another yet one more cycle. Right? We have an affirmative topic choice. <clears throat> could be, you know, whatever topic area you're working on, could be one of the strategic planning areas. You want to figure out what's good about who you are and what you're doing so you can build on your strength. You vision the future, you design it, and then 
try to figure out how to learn from it. The future, preferred futuring, was really very focused on how you do visioning. What is it that I want to do in the future? But it was compatible because it wasn't about looking at a gap or a deficit or something that's wrong with us. It was about thinking about the preferred future. Okay, here's your first activity. Everybody got a partner? Everybody? Everybody? You need someone to talk to. Can you sit next to someone? People who are not sitting next to someone? Just for four minutes, I promise. Then you can move back or whatever. <laughs> okay, so the mechanism in these workshops is the paired mini interview. In other words, you're going to talk to each other. One person is going to be the interviewer and the other person is going to be the interviewee. And then two minutes later, you're going to switch. And you're going to be the interviewer, and they're going to be the interviewee. And you're going to document what they say. And you can handle it, hand it to them, or you can say it out loud in a group, and then I document it for you. Whatever it is, it needs to have every voice, and the only way to do that is to make it smaller. You know if you're in a group, there are going to be a few people who are going to say a whole lot, and everyone else is just going to sit there. Okay, here's your, your question for the day. And you don't all have to be in the same organization, but one of you picks to be, okay, the one on the left is the interviewer first. On your left, this one. Okay, so you're the interviewer first, and then in two minutes I'm going to say switch, and you're going to go back, okay? Here's the question you are asking of each other. Imagine your organization or department you get to choose five years from now when everything is just as you always wished it could be. What's different? Okay? Two minutes starting now. I had to limit it. It's nice if you write it down and then you can hand it to them and then they'll always know. But you don't have to do that. Thirty seconds. Okay, now switch. Those who were interviewers are now being interviewed.
30 seconds. Okay, how was it? Do you want to keep going? You have more to say? Oh, okay. Well, you need to set this up for yourself so you can do this. So, okay, so a typical planning and assessment team workshop will do sort of three of those mini interview kind of things. The first one will be to identify the strengths and values in that group or that that department. So that question is, what is it that you most value about yourself, your work, and your department or group? And the reason for doing that is that you then get from each individual some introspection about what they have to offer and what they feel about how they're doing and contributing. The next part is really interesting because it's the active assessment and use of data piece. Some departments and divisions think they don't do this at all. But when you ask this next question, immediately becomes obvious that, of course, they do. Data come from everywhere. What have you changed about your work in the past year or two, and why did you think it should be changed? I think I got this from a Middle States conference, actually, this particular question. But it works really well. You can ask them, what did you do? And it can be very personal in their own job. It can be something that their department has changed. It can be anything, but every time you probe about why did you do that, there's a data piece behind it. Well, people were negative. Nobody showed up. I got complaints. I heard from, you know, data, 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 not just quantitative. Okay, then they did this one, and then they leave with a set of things that they think could be better. And just the fact that they've shared these with each other means that they're all going to start working toward them, even if they don't know they're doing that. Okay, when BMCC did this with the senior leadership, oof, we've got a ways to go. Our vision is to be a 21st century faculty, to have the best retention and graduation rates ever, to be inclusive in our planning and use our re planning for resource allocation and to be a global institution. We're working on all of those things now. And the work teams, same kind of thing. Action goals and in in indicators, but they're thinking camp campus-wide. They're not just working on the department, they're working on all of us, for all of us. The action planning worksheet, if you want one, let me know. Finally, what they get out of this capacity building is this ability to create strategic proposals, which is a very generic proposal-making apparatus. But this idea of helping everyone know how you get concrete about what it is you're going to change is the proposal process. And I also have this handout if you want. Okay, my favorite part, data, data, data. The swiftly flowing river, which I, again, borrowed from lesson study. But in my case, it's all about the swiftling, swiftly flowing river of the data that come at you daily, hourly, yearly, just will not stop coming at you. In CUNY, we get a lot of information about our campus and our key indicators according to CUNY. We also ask annually students and faculty about their satisfaction and how it's going. So some of this is student data, some of this is, is um, campus-wide uh, information system data. But we decided we needed to kind of parse it a little better. We have this campus-wide stuff, but we needed to drill down to, oh, I just said drill down, I'm sorry. We need to get down to the smaller groupings in order to be able to truly figure it out. So we took the CUNY performance management process indicators, some of them, fall to fall retention. Do you guys have key indicators at your campuses? Things that you look at every year and trend, right? So you get those charts 
Okay, so we've got fall, fall retention for new freshmen. Completing a gateway course within two years, we have lots of retention at BMCC. I mean, lots of um, developmental skills and basic skills. Attaining sophomore status, graduating with an associate degree. We also looked at milestone momentum. We looked at momentum things. How fast are they getting credits? What kind of GPA are they getting? If they don't keep a GPA up, then they don't get to stay. Do they enroll in summer school? I really, are they really trying to get through this? How quickly did they get their basic skills needs met? And are they done with it by the 30th credit? Because by the 60th credit, we want them to go on to a four-year school or take that, cred that credential and, and get a job. So we did this with our fall cohorts, combined them for four years, so we have a big group. We assumed that the trend would be pretty similar um, across all of those freshman experiences. And then <clears throat> I want you to make a prediction. How many of you are community colleges? Okay, so you know the answer. All right, if you come in and you test that you need basic skills, time will be added. And if you're using uh, federal assistance or financial aid of some sort, money will run out. These courses are expensive. We're doing everything we can to move these courses into a free environment like continuing ed. Raise your hand, Dean Gupta. Thank you very much. And the CUNY system itself has CUNY Start, which is also free plus immersion. But what we found in our momentum study in particular was that if you need any basic skills, on average, we're gonna, you're going to spend an extra semester. That means half of you or some, we didn't do median, so some proportion more than that will spend more than one semester. If you need English as a second language, the average is a year. In other words, many of you will spend more than a year just accomplishing that English language requirement. So here it is for our Hispanic freshmen. Uh, over the period of those four cohorts, about 40% of our, fresh, our freshmen were Hispanic, self-identified Hispanic. Now it's, I think, up to 46 since 2010. 46%, a growing percentage at BMCC. Out of those freshmen who came in, 90% of them needed some level of basic skills training. Only 10% were college ready, and that's typical for our college. At this point, I think we made a jump in the last semester, but we've been hovering at around 11 to 12 to 13% college ready students, and CUNY sends all their not college ready students to the community colleges. Out of those who needed basic skills, most of them were non-ESL. It wasn't about learning a second language, it was about graduating from high school in New York City. It was about not being able to write according to our standards, not being able to do math, not ever having taken algebra, or not remembering what happened. So a very small group, about 13% of this 90%, were actually ESL students, Hispanic. But it seemed to make a huge difference to their progress whether they came in as ESL or just needing basic skills help. So the three-year graduation rate for the, graduate, for the college ready students, Hispanic, non-Hispanic, not significantly different at about 20% for both groups. If they needed any basic skills training at all, not significantly different, about 10%, 10, 11% for both groups. But if they needed language training, if they were English as a second language, identified early in the, as a freshman, that was different. Something's happening. We need to do something particularly for our Hispanic students who are ESL. This is new data. We need to plan strategically. So this is what happens. This is a, my, this is a momentum point. I'm not talking about graduation now. I'm just talking about getting to sophomore status. That means staying around long enough to become a sophomore in a two-year school. And that group is tiny. OK, how do we build momentum? How do we build retention? I'm going to give you one example that we did a rigorous evaluation of, and that's the paired learning communities 
And this is the part <clears throat> where I, uh, I'm sorry, I really try to sell propensity score matching. Okay, so that's forewarning for you. This is what's going to happen. Did they make a difference? I know you all have pilot programs. You all have things that you're trying to do. You're never quite sure if it's making a difference. You kind of look at the raw data and you look at the, and you're just not quite sure. Okay. So theories of change, anybody who's had to do a, a Gates grant proposal, um, I connect for you here, theory of change and and uh, logic models just means that we thought we could lead to academic success by getting student and students into groupings, connecting faculty between the English language arts department and the core disciplinary department, having academic affairs support those pairings, and then it would increase bonding between faculty and staff and students. And this is what it looks like when it's in a logic model, same thing, only across, in case you want to do those. Those are nice for grants. Okay, so what do we measure? We had a survey pre and post. We couldn't match people on their survey results, but we could match people on their academic achievement results in passing and withdrawals. When you want to learn if something really worked, you have to compare it to something. And this is, you know, sort of esoteric statistician stuff. But the counterfactual means the best way for me to know if this worked is to know what would have happened to these students in my program if I had left them alone. If I had done nothing to help them in this particular way, what would have happened to them? Would they have gotten this good on their own? And without doing a comparison, you don't know what the alternative explanations are. They might have learned about it anyway. Somebody else in another program might have been doing something really fabulous, and they were all in it. They took our survey and saw the answers and said, I know what they want me to say by the end of the, the semester. The issue is that if you have a program where students are either self-selecting or you're taking a particular group, the chances are they're different before you start to compare them to the overall group. Okay, we had a lot of people in a possible comparison group. In the sections where we did paired learning communities, we had 290, we had um, 293 students in the language classes, 192 students in the other. We had almost 8,000 students in the pool of comparisons. When we looked at the achievement results, just looking at our paired learning community students and the overall group of 8,000, oh, in this case, 14,000, we added all those sections together, it doesn't look so good. There's no difference. We did all of this work to connect people and bond them and make these people work together and, you know, plan, they're not significantly different. And they had slightly lower pass rates. Maybe it's not worth the bother. But wait. They were different before the program started. They started at a different place. The PLC group was younger. They were more likely to be underrepresented. They had lower average scores on reading and writing placement. They were more likely to be first-time freshmen. They had a lower GPA. They had fewer accumulated credits. There would have been a difference in their performance. So what we did was we matched and I'll spare you the detail about how we do that, but I'll give it to you. If you want, I can send you syntax. Basically, we tried to figure out how, find students that were identical to the ones who were in our group. And we can do this statistically now with a probability function. We had a large pool, so we just kept pulling out exact matches and formed an identical group. We used prior characteristics, not things that happened at the end of the semester, but things that happened before they started working with our paired learning communities. When we were done matching, there were no significant differences 
between our intervention group and our comparison group. Did it work? Remember, this is what happened. No significant difference. This is what happened after. After the matching, the students who went into our PLC when matched with students who were like them at the beginning of the semester, those students did not do well without the paired learning communities. Their pass rates in social science were particularly lower, significantly lower, like 10% lower. Having those faculty work together with the core discipline people and the language people seemed to really make a difference. So okay, so now we have what we consider rigorous evidence. Paired learning communities is a good idea. We're going to put it in our freshman learning academies. And now we have freshman learning academies. <clears throat> it doesn't always work that nicely for your program. Because sometimes students who choose to go into a program, in this case, they hadn't chosen to go into paired learning committees. It just sort of happened to them. We kind of assigned them, but not randomly. But choose, students who choose to take advantage of your good stuff, like tutoring or orientation or whatever help you have out there, supplemental instruction, what do you think? Are they the same or are they different from the regular population? They're different, right? You know these kids. They're hard driving. What would happen if we matched them and then looked at the effectiveness of the program? Students, who, when we did this with tutoring, the tutoring group was further along. They had lower initial placement scores, but they had a higher grade point average and more credits accumulated. In other words, that's my proxy for motivation now. If you start out at the same entrance exam level, and yet by the end of a semester or two semesters, you've got a higher GPA and you've got more accumulated credits, then you are a motivated student. Students who go to tutoring are motivated students. So if you just did the unmatched sample, comparing students in tutoring to students not in tutoring, oh my gosh, look how great tutoring is. Everybody in tutoring is passing, right? But what happens if you match them? All that great difference, positive difference for tutoring disappears. It's a much tougher measure. Now you're going to find out which tutoring programs are really working to add value for students. OK, almost done. Learning organization, um, Baldrige. How many people know about Baldrige? Baldrige, all right, Baldrige. Our president loves this graphic, and you can't see it. OK, it's a range of organizational, um, organizational condition, right? Here you are at level one. You react to the problem. You pick up the hose, and you put out the fire. If you're in this organization, you know who the firemen are, right? It gets to crisis. There are way too many crises. It gets to crisis, and then you beg, and then so-and-so comes in, sorts it all out, solves the problem, and everybody loves so-and-so. But they also resent them because we're in crisis too much. We don't want to be there. It's really, it's really got to be a better way. And then you kind of move along. OK, we'll have more fire hoses. OK, we have more firemen. This is great. No. And then you look for the places where the sprinklers need to go. We still have fires. And then, OK, now we've got automatic sprinklers. You don't just have to pull the thing. It's already. Ultimately, where we want to be is here. We want to be fireproof. We want to be able to say, we knew it was going to happen. We've planned for it. We've made sure that it doesn't go to crisis. We know what we're doing. We have a plan. OK, so favorite from the 90s. This one's really easy in higher education, because you are all here. You all do this. You've chosen this work because you're this kind of person. Because you can see the big picture, and you can distinguish patterns. 
because you're committed to lifelong learning. That's why you're here. You know that learning continues. If you're part of this institution, you're going to learn more all the time. Because you try to understand yourself. You know that your belief structures affect how you affect others and what you think. You need to know your own biases and prejudices, and you, can f and you want to do these things because you know that you can't work together unless you do. Building a shared vision, this is what I hope you'll all try to do because you can't do it by yourself. Not only is the group smarter, but you get more done. And you come together, and you talk, and you have those conversations that are hard, and you have goals, and you work for them, even if you're not compensated, because you know this is going to be good for students. OK, you get to take this test again. Any questions? And I guess this PowerPoint will go up on the, on the website, but you guys can ask for the, the forms. Um, there's another book that I used called Collaborative Planning in Higher Education. I can't remember the, the name of the author right now, but anything you want to know more about, if you need the syntax for propensity score matching, um, it's now cutie, cutie, cutie wide that we're doing this. So. Um, Okay, then let's uh, thank Dr. Jane Delgado for her presentation. Are there any questions from the audience? Uh, anyone? Yes? Dr. Laman is asking, how did we get the, stra the strategic groups together? We had an open call. We said, I don't think I called it Vision Day the first year, but we sent out a massive email to everybody on campus. Um, we said, we, we knew that the senior leadership were going to be there. That, that had to happen. But we invited whoever wanted to come to participate in this process of helping the campus uh, learn how to improve collaboratively, collaboratively and to plan strategically. So we had probably about 80 to 100 people the first time. And it was all interactive. It was, you know, here we did values, we did strengths, we did brainstorming, you know, so the paired stuff. And we put the brainstorming around the wall on big post-it butcher paper. And everybody got dots. Remember the dots? You guys have done dots, right? And then everybody went and voted for those ideas that they thought were particularly interesting. And then we talked about those things that seemed to resonate in the room and consolidated them. We ended up with about five or six different things that general agreement was, yeah, this should be happening here at BMCC. And then we said, OK, now we're going to form work teams. If you want to work on this thing over here, if you want to work on that thing over there, if you want to work on that thing. And actually, actually, I think the first time I did it, I did it in separate groups. So people were invited to come and talk about faculty success and come and talk about um, student success or come and talk about institutional. I had different times when they could show up. They had to the RSVP. They showed up at these times, and then they did their brainstorming. So it was easier. Once they had voted and formed work teams, what we discovered was that people may think something's a really good idea, but they aren't necessarily going to work on it. So some of those great ideas were abandoned. And as we built, um, they started the action planning and started looking at how you actually do something. Sometimes the groups grew. Sometimes whatever it was they were working on happened anyway, and so they ended. Sometimes they got all the way to the proposal stage, and it became part of the strategic plan. So the issue was persisting. So it's not just persistence for students, it's persistence for administrators. Yes. 
Um, not so many students. You know, sometimes these projects take two, three years to come to fruition. So students, the actual the way that the students have been used now is that they they have this voice of urgency when they come to those kickoff meetings and they brainstorm and they say, please, please, please improve customer service. Please, I can't get through on the phone. I don't know what to call. You know, is it those kind of things? we take seriously. There's someone in the room who's in admissions or in retention, or in, and they say, we're going to do a work team around that. Another question? Another question? Resources. What it's done, and it's done it not so much in the steering committees. Most of the projects that came out of the steering committees were pretty low cost in terms of what they needed to do. We had other projects that were embraced. The ideas come in there sometimes embraced by a division. And the divisions have a little more clout in terms of how resources get allocated. So we did a combination of things that emanated from the steering committees as well as things that were already a decision process that had been made because we had allocated resources. And what it allows us to do now is to justify everything in terms of our strategic plan. This is important because it's part of this particular priority, it's this subject objective, it fits in our mission, it's compatible with the CUNY master plan, it's blah, blah, blah. So once it's in our strategic plan, you don't have to argue much about whether it's justified it's there. And sometimes it's things that we had decided to do before we began this process, but now it's documented. They are our strategic commitment in terms of resources. Any other questions? Any more questions? Well, again, thank you. Sure. Sure. Uh, remember that the uh, presentation of uh, the recording will be available at the uh, HEADS uh, portal in the coming weeks, and I'm sure that all the uh, documents that she mentioned will be able to upload them also to the website so you can uh, look at them in detail later on. So now we're going to have our break for lunch. Uh, lunch is in the uh, uh, sporting area uh, outside. I guess there'll be people that will tell you where to go. We'll reconvene at 1.30 according to the uh, program. So have a good uh, lunch, and we'll see you this afternoon. Thank you all. Hand over the, uh, the evaluation form, please. Uh, if, if you fill it out, leave it at the end of each row, and I'll pick them up as you walk out. Thank you.